This is the third lecture in a series of six lectures on the book between the book of Acts. And uh, the last moments of the uh, former lecture, we were calling our attention to those events in Acts chapter 5. And actually, as we said before, the book of Acts really deals with four men. There are many characters appearing in the book of Acts, but these four men, Peter and Stephen and Philip, and then, of course, uh, the most famous of all, the Apostle Paul. In the, life of same, uh, in the life of Simon Peter, or I should say in the ministry of Simon Peter in the book of Acts, we have, as you will note in your, uh, your book, have divided his study, a study of his life and ministry, into, t into 11 areas. Uh, there is Peter and the 120 in the upper room, and then Peter, the crowd at Pentecost, his sermon, and number three, Peter and the lame man, the temple, and then Peter and the high priest, and now Peter and Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 5. And the other ones we'll deal with will be Peter and his relationship to the lawyer Gamaliel, and then Peter and uh, Simon the sorcerer, and then Simon Peter and Aeneas, and number nine, Simon raising Dorcas from the dead, and ten, his uh, visit to Cornelius, and number 11, Simon Peter and the angel of God. So these 11 events, and these 11 individuals, pretty well summarize Simon's part uh, in the book between, this bridge book, the book of Acts. Now, we had already introduced chapter 5 by noting some of the events transpiring in chapter 4 especially a man called Barnabas and probably others who had sold their land and farms in the early days of the church and had given everything to the local church there in Jerusalem. And uh, so uh, Barnabas then had been praised, doubtless, for this and, and uh, had received a lot of uh, uh, good comments. And so Ananias and Sapphira decided to do this but what they felt is that they did not, need not, sell it all. Uh, I mean, uh, give it all of the price that they did sell. And certainly they didn't have to. There was nothing in the uh, Word of God, certainly nothing at that time, that would command them to sell anything. God did expect their tithes and offerings, but Simon Peter later on says, Was it not thine own? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own? Uh, you could, uh, you could uh, not sell it, he said, or if you wanted to sell it, as you did, you could keep the, uh, the, uh, the loot, and you didn't have to turn it in. Well, we'll read this. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of it, of the price, his wife also knowing of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And probably everybody then said, oh, what a wonderful man Ananias is, and what a wonderful godly uh, self-sacrificing couple Ananias and Sapphira is. But in verse 3, Peter said, either he found out about it, by a human way, or God himself revealed this. It could have been either way. But he realizes that Ananias and Sapphira have lied here. And he says, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep back a part of the price of the Lamb? Now, I believe that these verses here give us the first example, concrete example, in the New Testament of that sin unto death. There are other sins mentioned in the Bible, of course, uh, but I think one of the most tragic sins, one of the most feared sins, is a sin that only a believer can commit, and that is the sin unto death. Uh, we some time ago discussed our feelings on the unpardonable sin. I don't think that's a sin any unbeliever can commit today or any believer can commit. But the sin unto death is a tragic possibility. Uh, here Ananias and Sapphira commit it, and then later on a number apparently of the 
Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 committed that sin also. Because there Paul says, uh, for this cause, uh, the reason being there that many of them had uh, uh, disgraced themselves at the Lord's table, he said, for this cause, many are sickly among you, and he said, many sleep. Now, he wasn't talking about uh, some of them had sacked out during the communion service, but the word sleep means dead. And many of you have lost loved ones uh, that have committed the sin unto death. So, by way of definition, I believe the sin unto death is uh, soul hardening our hearts down here as believers that finally God just removes us early and uh, takes us out of this world. Like uh, mother perhaps says to her children, now, uh, dinner won't be ready till 6 o'clock tonight, or to 6 o'clock this evening, and, and here it is just 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and if you kids behave yourself, you can play outside. And so uh, soon uh, one of the kids is fighting, and so she tells him, now look, uh, I'm going to warn you about this. Uh, I don't want any problems. I'm busy in here cooking, and, and you can stay out and play till 6 if you behave yourself. But now if you don't, I'll have to take measures and... So let's say that uh, about 4 o'clock or 4.30, uh, uh, she hears a scuffle and uh, one of the uh, little boys has hit another little boy and, and uh, the little kid is, uh, both of them are crying. And so finally she brings the little troublemaker in. She brings him in early. The others get to play out till 6 o'clock. But she brings him in and makes him sit down uh, to punish him for... Uh, his disobedience. Now, I believe that's a crude example, but I think it's a correct one of the sin unto death. And by the way, these are believers. I think there is one little word that uh, would clue us in that Ananias and Sapphira are both believers. And the little word why in verse 3, Peter said uh, to Ananias, Ananias, why hast thou done this? Why? Have you allowed Satan to do this to you, to influence you? Now, you don't say that to an unsaved person. Uh, you don't ask an unsaved person why he drinks. You would ask a saved person that. Hey, why are you drinking? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Don't you know you're not your own? Why are you doing this? You don't ask an unsaved person that. You know why he's doing it. Because he belongs to Satan. Here Ananias was influenced by Satan, but he belongs to Satan. And uh, so you don't ask him why, uh, you just tell him what. <laughs> and here is what you tell him, that he needs to be saved, you see. So you only ask a believer why he sins, not an unbeliever, because an unbeliever has to sin. Why has Satan, the Bible says, fill thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back a part of the land? And then he says, Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and died, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. Uh, Ananias now is exposed by Peter, and he's executed by God for his sin of lying to the Holy Spirit. Well, some three hours after his death, of course, Sapphira... Uh, who comes in, and she doesn't know what's happened, and she does the same thing, she lies. She was examined by Peter and was judged in the same manner as was her husband. Now, you see, Satan had first attacked the church from without in Acts chapter 4. Remember, the Sanhedrin had warned them and harassed uh, them for preaching Jesus, and he'd done this as a roaring lion. And doesn't work, so now he attacks it from within as a serpent. All right, now, in uh, Acts chapter 5, verses 12 to 40, 42, we have Simon Peter and the lawyer Gamaliel. Uh, we know a few facts about Gamaliel. Uh, Simon here has a confrontation uh, with him, and apparently this happens after... The apostles, in verse 12, they work uh, many signs and wonders among the people. And then, as we have in our notes, notice uh, the last five words in verse 16. Uh, they came, a lot of people came, 
and they were healed, every one. I have been to a number of faith healing meetings, and I have never, never seen uh, even a strong minority, a large minority of sick people healed. I've certainly never seen a majority, and I have never seen every single person. But every single one brought to uh, the disciples here, especially Peter and James and John, were healed. And I think that uh, if the modern faith healers claim that they have the same power uh, that the apostles did in the book of Acts, they ought to be able to do the same things. Now, by the way, some may ask, uh, why do you attack faith healers? And the answer is, I don't attack faith healers. I am sure many are sincere. I'm confident some are insincere. But I do attack the philosophy. I have before me a statement uh, made by one of the most well-known faith healers of the day. And this statement has, I'm sure, has uh, brought much grief and sorrow and harm and uh, spiritual uh, frustration to thousands of believers. And the statement is this, and uh, here's what he says. He says, it is never God's will for a believer to remain ill over a long period of time. Now, that's a quotation. Now, uh, every uh, suffering child of God who would read something like this, and if he would believe it, he can only conclude that he was somehow sinning or that God had taken a dislike to him. But you see, it is totally unscriptural. The, uh, the Lord tells Moses in Exodus 4, he says, uh, Moses said, I can't go tell Pharaoh to let my people go, let God's people go, for I am slow of speech. In other words, he probably had a stammering problem. And uh, so Moses said, I've made your mouth. Or God says to Moses, I've made you. And he said, also, have I not made the deaf and the dumb and the lame? So God allows certain people to be born that way for his glory. And for a faith healer to say that it is never God's will for a believer to be ill or to remain sick is simply to contradict the clear revealed word of God and to bring much frustration and much sorrow. Uh, a recent faith healer died, of course, of uh, sclerosis of the liver. And when they examined the, uh, the autopsy revealed that the faith healer had become, had, was an alcoholic. And uh, even after that, another faith healer died of a massive heart attack. Uh, and actually, it was more than just a heart attack. It was a, uh, a heart sickness. Uh, this person had, heart, had uh, apparently a heart condition for, for a number of years. Well, how do you explain this? Except that uh, this philosophy be not of God. Well, at any rate, uh, they are cast into prison for their testimony by the wicked Pharisees. Remember, they've been warned, now don't do it, and they had already done it, and so now they're in prison, and this is the first real physical persecution that they endure. In chapter 5, verse 28, uh, the high priest discuss this matter with them, he says, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach him this name? And behold, ye have filled with Jerusalem with your doctrine. That was probably the greatest testimony, the greatest compliment that they could be paid. You have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. And then he goes on to say something that is not true. The first part was, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. No, they had forgotten, very conveniently, they had forgotten what they themselves had said a very short time before this. Uh, when Pilate brought out Jesus, the, uh, this man in the statement they're talking about here, and then he had brought out Barabbas, and he said, all right, now you Pharisees and scribes and leaders of the Jews, uh, should I release Jesus or Barabbas? And of course, they all cried out, Barabbas. And he said, what shall I do with Jesus? You're king. And they said, 
we have no king but Caesar. And they said, crucify him, crucify him, his blood be on our heads. God took them literally uh, with those, at those words. So uh, the disciples, the apostles now, uh, were not going to bring Jesus' blood upon the Pharisees. They had brought that blood down upon their own heads, crashing down upon their own heads. Um, in uh, chapter, let's see here, chapter 5, verse 33, the uh, Bible says, uh, I'm going to read that if I can find it, verse 33, I'm trying to look at my notes in the scripture here too. When they heard that, the words where Simon Peter here now again preaches his third message uh, concerning the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection, and he charges the Jews with the murder of Christ. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. They would have killed them right on the spot. And the reason I read that verse, I wanted to, uh, to tie it in uh, with another passage in chapter 7, verse 54. When we come to the life of Stephen, we'll uh, note that, again, his message cut them to the heart. Uh, I have noted in my own ministry, my own life, and also in the experiences of others, that the things, the accusations that make me the maddest, I mean, if they're made against me, are those accusations that are true. Uh, some time ago, uh, I was accused of something that uh, I thought was rather amusing. Uh, one of my uh, former members of a church that I'd pastored called me up and said, Pastor, there's a rumor going around here about you, and we're glad that you're Thomas Road and everything, but and you had a good ministry while you were here, but, but there's a rumor, and I'm just not sure it's true or not, but uh, we want you to tell us. And I said, all right, what is it? He said, well, I just know it isn't true. And he kept going on and on. And, and I thought, oh, my, I wonder if they're accusing me of cannibalism, you know, I, or maybe being a member of the Communist Party. He said, well, here it is, Pastor. He said, have you been married more than one time? And I just burst out laughing. I said, well, I sure don't think so. I said, uh, if I uh, have, I don't remember it. And he said, well, he said, I just knew that you hadn't, but <clears throat> he said the rumor <clears throat> had, uh, had been pretty hot and heavy that you had been married more than one time. And when we finally tracked the rumor down, uh, I had uh, often said, uh, I have a little habit of saying, uh, yes, uh, in Illinois, I met my first wife. Well, it's the only wife I've ever had, and her name is Sue Wilmington, and the grace of God, the only one I ever want to have. So, you know, I had mentioned uh, meeting my first wife there, and there was a lady, and bless her heart, she, I'm sure, meant well, but she just assumed that uh, uh, my uh, wife at that time was my second wife because I met my first wife in Illinois. But that didn't make me mad at all because it just wasn't true, and I knew it wasn't true. Uh, but the things that uh, sometimes I've been accused of when I probably have been guilty of doing them, I, uh, I, uh, I get very upset wrongly so, I should say. And here they are cut to the heart because they knew that what he was saying was exactly true. And they would have killed him on the spot had it not been for this Pharisee named Gamaliel. Now later on, as I say, we uh, learn a little more about him. The Apostle Paul gives us uh, this fact. He said that he sat at his feet. So Gamaliel was the teacher of the day probably even more well-known than was Nicodemus in his day, or perhaps similar to that type of reputation. And he was a highly respected Jewish doctor of the law, and he offered the following advice. He said, refrain from these men and let them alone. Be careful how you jump in here. For this counsel uh, of this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. I think that's pretty good advice, uh, you know, to keep your eye on a, on a church when it moves in. And if it's uh, a church, uh, you don't know too much about the pastor, you don't know too much about uh, the background of the church, uh, you sort of watch it and see if it preaches the book Blood and Blessed Hope. And if it does, 
if people get saved and, and homes are reunited again, you know it's of the Lord. But if it doesn't, then you just know it isn't. Uh, when our young men leave here, and sometimes they're not too young, we send out men from the Institute in their 40s and 50s to start churches. And I always tell them, now, fellas, you're going to have to prove yourself. And you go in and start a church and, and do uh, the best you can. But don't expect everybody to come flocking to you. Uh, some are going to stand back, maybe even a little longer than they should. But they're going to stand back and just see if you're of the Lord and uh, to see what you're going to do. So uh, that's what Gamaliel was telling him, and I think that's, that was pretty good advice. Uh, and his words were heeded. Well, the disciples then were taken out again and beaten. This is their first physical suffering, and a, a severe warning accompanied this suffering, uh, and here the threat of death, saying, well, the first time we just put you in prison, uh, this time we're beating you, and the next time it's going to be off with your ever-loving heads if you do this again. Well, the reaction, and oh, how I like this. They didn't try to cooperate with City Hall. Uh, they said this, uh, <clears throat> that we have to obey the Lord. And then in verse 41 and 42, they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name, and daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So the revival continued, and every time Satan attempted to put out the fire uh, by throwing what he thought was water on it, God miraculously changed by persecution, God changed that water into kerosene and gasoline, and the more uh, he threw upon the fire, the brighter it burned. Someone has said, and I believe it's true, that the trouble with Christians today is that there's nobody trying to kill them, especially in America. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ has always uh, burned the brightest through the darkest persecutions. All right, now, uh, number seven in our study of the 11 events in the ministry of Simon Peter, Simon Peter and Simon the sorcerer. Uh, Peter and John, here in chapter 8, are sent by the Jerusalem church to aid in the new work which had begun in Samaria as a result of Philip's preaching. Remember Philip was, we'll get to him a little later, was a deacon, and now uh, uh, he's, uh, he's an evangelist, and he's holding the greater Samaritan crusade, and many people are being saved. So uh, we read that they're sent there to help out in this ministry. And by the way, in your notes, I won't take time to do this because to read it, I have hopefully explained it rather thoroughly here concerning the phrase of Peter and uh, John laying hands on the Samaritans that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Uh, please look at my comment on chapter 8, verse 15 where we've quoted from, among other authors here, Dr. Homer Kent, a Greek scholar at Grace Theological Seminary in Wino Lick, Indiana. All right, uh, it is thrilling, as we have noted here, that uh, it was John, as well as Simon Peter, who aided in this, in this ministry to the Samaritans. Because uh, you remember a few years before this, he and his brother James, James and John, uh, Jesus called them the apostles of thunder because they were rough and rugged men and they had once asked Jesus to call down fire from heaven upon that race of people. In Luke 9 it said that the Samaritans did not receive Jesus and uh, they turned their faces from him and Peter and John says let's get uh, even with them let's burn that scum from the face of the earth send down fire and just consume them. Well, uh, John has changed now, as well as James, I'm sure, and now he's gladly ministering, along with Simon Peter, uh, John is, to the Samaritan believers. Well, at this time, there was a religious charlatan, a crook, uh, by the name of Simon, and he attempted to purchase with money from Peter and John the power of the Holy Spirit. And he saw this, and he thought that was fantastic, and he, he wanted a piece of the action. 
And uh, actually his uh, request here, of course, has given to the vocabulary of the uh, Christian church the word simony, which denotes the buying and selling of ecclesiastical rights and offices. And the Roman Catholic Church throughout the Middle Ages was notorious in doing this. A pope, uh, the office of a pope could be purchased uh, as uh, all other offices could. If you had enough money, uh, you could do just about anything. And this is not limited, of course, to Catholics. Uh, Protestants have been guilty of this. And um, fundamentalists, I think, on occasion have been guilty of it, radio evangelists, etc. And... Uh, so we still are plagued with the uh, charlatan Simons today and simony. Uh, he was not saved, and Jesus himself had previously discounted this kind of false faith. He had some belief in the Savior, Simon did, as the men in John chapter 2 had, but they were not saved. You remember, they wanted to commit their selves to, themselves to Jesus, but were told that he did not commit himself to them for he knew the thoughts of all men. So he knew uh, them, and uh, the Spirit of God, of course, had not had the opportunity to indwell the heart of Simon. For Simon was not interested in having his heart indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He was simply interested in having his pocket filled with the money that could come from the power of the Holy Spirit if he could somehow buy it uh, on a, a time payment arrangement of money. Uh, in the 1880s, the American circus showman and promoter P.T. Uh, Barnum uh, attempted, remember he said a sucker is born every moment, and he attempted to entice the great London Baptist preacher Charles H. Spurden to join his act. Uh, Barnum, of course, was in America, and he heard that this famous preacher and all many people in America were very impressed with him. At that time, I suppose Spurgeon was the most famous preacher in the world. And uh, so he invited Spurgeon to visit America. He had never visited America. And uh, he uh, suggested that they could work out a deal. He said that Spurgeon would be furnished with a huge tent and guaranteed a full house to preach to and be paid $1,000 per preaching performance. Now, that would almost be like $50,000 today. And all Barnum wanted in return was to pocket the ticket tape. So he would probably uh, charge a couple of dollars uh, a head, and uh, he could make all kinds of money. Uh, what uh, audacity, uh, audacity here this man had. Well, upon receiving this brazen offer, uh, we're told that Spurgeon answered as follows. He said, Dear Mr. Barnum, I have received, I have before me your offer to come to America. You will find my answer in the book of Acts, chapter 8, verse 20, very sincerely, C.H. Spurgeon, and had this materialistic promoter turned to the book of Acts, he would have read these words that uh, Simon Peter said to, to Simon, the, uh, the sorcerer here. He said, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. They say everything has its price, money-wise. Well, salvation does not have its price money-wise. Believers are redeemed and filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, not with corruptible things such as silver and gold. Number eight in the 11 events in the life of Peter, we have Peter and Aeneas in chapter nine. Now here, Peter instantly heals a paralyzed man named Aeneas who had been bedridden for eight years in Lydia. With the possible exception of Jesus on one occasion where he uh, touched the man's eyes who could not see and he says can you see and the man says well I uh, I can see men as trees you know I can I'm getting my sight back I don't have it completely and then Jesus touched him again the second look the second touch and and then he could see clearly so with that exception uh, I believe I can say without any fear of contradiction that all the miracles re uh, re uh, regarding healing in both Old and New Testament were instantaneous, immediately. They didn't, uh, with exception, this one with Jesus, and then that happened in a matter of a few minutes probably, but the rest, uh, the scripture says that 
that the second that the words and prayers were spoken, they were healed immediately. And they, in fact, they would jump up and praise God, etc. Or they would run and uh, talk about their miracle. Uh, some time ago, I saw a, 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 a meeting on uh, a program on uh, television, and the uh, healer had uh, put his hands upon a person, and he, the person uh, at the beginning of the of the program, and then 30 minutes later, the, the fellow was a cripple. And 30 minutes later, here the, the guy came up again, and he was still walking with a limp. Well, this is very embarrassing, but uh, I thought it was rather unique the way the healer got out of it. He said, well, he said, I see that you're a lot better. I mean, uh, you're just, uh, you know, you're just barely limping now, and you were limping quite severely a half hour ago. But you see, he said, that's often the way God does things. He, he, uh, sometimes the, the, the healing takes, uh, takes place over a long period of time. <laughs> well, I don't know what God he's referring to there, uh, but it wasn't the God of the Bible, because there, healing took place immediately. So this uh, eight-year uh, invalid now jumps to his feet and is instantly healed. Uh, then uh, number nine in these events, the raising from the dead of Peter and uh, I should say uh, of Dorcas on the part of Simon Peter. He's apparently invited to preach her funeral and she's all laid out there ready, uh, you know, for the words to be said over and then they're going to close the coffin and bury her. Uh, but Simon Peter determines to raise her uh, from the dead. This is the seventh of eight biblical uh, resurrections of dead bodies to mortal living bodies. There will be one more, of course, the Apostle Paul, and uh, he'll do that to, uh, later on in, in um, the city of Troas. Uh, and when we discuss the doctrine of Christ, we said that we do not count Christ in this resurrection group because all these including here Dorcas now of course will die have a second funeral but now he raises her from the dead and then number 10 in these 11 events Simon Peter and Cornelius and after raising Dorcas Peter remains here for a while at Joppa at the house of a tanner by the name of Simon there are a number of Simons in the Bible now this is not the same same Simon uh, there in um, Acts chapter 8. Here's another Simon. Uh, apparently Peter's attitude by this time toward the restrictions of Judaism had changed somewhat, although he would still need a vision from God, uh, because of where he was staying. Here he was staying with a skin tanner, and this was an unclean trade in the eyes of the Jews, for it involved the handling of dead bodies. So uh, in the Old Testament they would not have been allowed to do that, because of the Levitical law, the ceremonial law. Uh, you see, one of the big problems the Lord had with the apostles after the ascension was to, first of all, get them out of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, he had to drive them out by way of a persecution into Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. And uh, they wanted to stay right there where they were. And secondly, they still had a tendency to minister to just Jewish people. In fact, later on, even after this, Simon Peter sort of lapsed back into legalism again, and the Apostle Paul, and, and he tells us about it in Galatians 1 and 2, has to tell him off. He said, I withstood Peter because he was to be blamed uh, because he was refusing to associate with Gentiles uh, that uh, had not been circumcised. So uh, then in Acts 15, there's a big argument in the local church there as to whether uh, saved Gentiles would have to submit, should submit to the uh, rite, R-I-T-E, to the ceremony of circumcision. So here, uh, Simon Peter is uh, on the housetop, apparently up there waiting for lunch to be cooked uh, uh, right below. And uh, in Caesarea, some 30 miles up the coast, at the same time that Simon's waiting to uh, get some chow, as it were, uh, there was a Gentile Roman officer named Cornelius, and he was seeking salvation. Uh, Cornelius had a lot of good things going for him. The Bible says that he was a centurion. This means he was a commander of at least 100 Roman soldiers, and uh, this made him an important man. He had a good-paying job. He was respected. The Bible says that he was a devout man, but he had a problem. 
the same problem that Nicodemus had. He was lost. And so he desires now to be saved. And so an angel appears telling Cornelius to send for Peter at Joppa. Now, I've often stated, and sometimes students may wonder about this, well, is this really true, Wilmington, that there are three factors necessary for the salvation of a sinner. And no sinner has ever been saved apart, apart from Adam. Now, Adam was saved without all three of these, uh, simply because uh, one of them wasn't present on earth at that time. But these three, the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and the soul winner of God. Now, in Adam's time... Uh, the Spirit of God and the Word of God was there, but uh, the soul winner of God was not there. And so God had to lead Adam to Christ. God had to tell Adam to be saved. But from apart from that, I don't think you can demonstrate anywhere in the Old or New Testament where a person was saved apart from these three. Uh, the Spirit of God has to be present. And the Word of God, the plan of salvation, has to be there. And some human agent has to be involved. Agency has to be involved. And uh, you might say, oh, no, that's not true, because I'll tell you what, in my own case, I was saved by reading a track, and there was nobody around. Well, who do you think wrote that track? Uh, do you think that God chose a hummingbird or an anteater uh, or uh, a kitten to write that? Who do you think wrote that track? And after it was written, who do you think printed that track? And who do you think distributed that track? It was a man or men. So I'm not saying that uh, they have to come in and actually talk to you, but I'm saying that God uses human beings to lead other human beings to Christ. And I think this is the proof of the pudding here. Uh, here, uh, Cornelius wants to be saved. And do you think the angel of the Lord, now we don't know who the angel of the Lord is here. I'm, I don't think that he was, I'm sure he wasn't Jesus, in the old, like in the Old Testament. He was probably Gabriel or Michael, or some other angel perhaps. But do you think that this angel knew the plan of salvation? Of course he did. Um, but why didn't he tell Cornelius? Because God didn't want angels to preach the message of salvation. Now during the millennium, or during the tribulation, they'll get a chance to do that. John sees an, an angel preaching the everlasting gospel. But at this time, God uses men. And so he uh, does tell Cornelius to uh, send some men down to Simon Peter and that uh, for Simon Peter to come back and tell him how to be saved. Well, this is exactly what happens. So on their way down there, God now prepares the soul winner. He's already prepared the seeking sinner, and now he's going to prepare the soul winner. And God works on both ends of the line here, of course. So he lets this vision down from heaven, all kinds of unclean thing, lets his sheet down, rather, in he causes Simon Peter to have a vision, and uh, he tells Peter to rise, kill, and eat. And Peter makes a statement. He says, not so, Lord. He said, for I have never eaten any unclean thing. And then the Lord tries to show him that what God had cleansed, he was not to call common. And Simon said, well, okay, I don't want to eat that, but I will. And then I think the sheet disappeared. And I think Peter uh, said, uh, what in the world was that all about? Well, about that time there was a, excuse me, uh, Simon, perhaps a message. You're wanted downstairs. There are some uh, men that, uh, that want to see you. You have some visitors. So he came down there, and, and they told him uh, what their master had had happen to him. And then Peter realized that uh, God was in this thing, and Doubtless, uh, knowing that Cornelius was a Gentile, he understood God was trying to tell him something in that vision. So he's warmly welcomed now by Cornelius, who attempts to worship him. You see, Cornelius just doesn't know anything about being saved. And, and so Simon Peter says, uh, stand up, I am, I'm a man. Uh, later on, the Apostle Paul in uh, Acts 14 will say the same thing. Some people at Lystra attempt to worship him. He said, he's horrified. Don't, don't do that. And when you see pictures now, or actually when you actually see ceremonies on the television uh, sets where men bow down and kiss uh, the, uh, the ring on other men's fingers and then claim to be a successor, a vicar of Simon Peter, 
Simon Peter would have disowned that immediately. I am a man. Let me tell you, friends, the only difference between a saint and a sinner is the Savior. That's the only difference. Now, there are some saints, uh, separated ones, that are closer uh, to the Lord. I mean to say they are spirit-filled and they'll do a better job, but we're all saints. All believers are saints. All right, so he now has the opportunity to lead him to Christ. He begins by, again with the cross, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Ghost, and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And then God, here we're told that the Jews slew and hanged on a tree. So he begins with the person of Jesus. There's no such thing as a social gospel. There's only a sinner gospel. The gospel is about Jesus. And even as he spoke, uh, God's Spirit fell upon this group, and Cornelius and others in his household are saved and then baptized by Simon Peter. And then number 11, the final event in the life of Simon Peter. We have about four minutes. We'll summarize this. Simon Peter and the angel of God. Simon is thrown in jail here in Acts 12. Uh, apparently along with uh, James about the same time that James the Apostle and James is killed and uh, the Jews seem to like that the Pharisees so Herod who was the grandson of uh, Herod the Great he decides to make uh, another uh, case a demonstration here of what uh, he felt toward Christianity and he was going to kill Simon Peter the next morning well Simon's Sacked out now because he knows God's going to get him out of this. He remembered Simon or that Jesus had told him he'd live to be an old man and he's still a young man. So in the middle of the night, we're told that God sent an angel, this mighty angel, perhaps that got him out of prison in the first place in, in uh, Acts chapter 5. And uh, the angel wakes him and gets him out of prison. Well, as soon as he gets out, he understands there's a prayer meeting that is taking place uh, for his behalf at uh, one of the churches, one of the, uh, uh, could be the upper room, we're not sure where it was, uh, but at any rate, uh, he says, well, I better uh, go down there and tell them that, you know, I'm, I'm free now and we can uh, stop the prayer meeting and, and begin to praise God because he's answered prayer. Of course, you know the situation, he knocks on the door and uh, he can't get in. And they got it all shut, and they're, they're praying, oh, God release Simon Peter. And finally, a little girl named Rhoda uh, recognizes him and reports it to Deacon Jones, who's on his knees praying, oh, thou God of the universe, thou eternal architect of this world, uh, release our brother Simon Peter. And, and, uh, but he wouldn't believe. He didn't believe that Simon was actually outside. And finally, uh, when he did... Uh, was aware that there was something out there. He said, well, it's his ghost. He can't be Simon Peter because we're inside praying for him. And he finally got in. And you know, as I've stated before, sometimes the most surprised group on earth when God does a great miracle is that very group that's been praying for it. But let me say that Simon Peter had a harder uh, task getting in that prayer meeting for him than he did getting out of the prison. Well, we'll stop this tape and also uh, the summary of the life of Simon Peter in the book of Acts at this time.